um, you've got lots of these powerhouses called mitochondria in muscles, uh, and those the way that those mitochondria work are affected, uh, so they're compromised and they just don't work as well. Uh, and so you tend to have weak muscles, and that is particularly obvious in muscles that need to produce a lot of power. So the muscles at the top of your legs, they particularly need to produce a lot of power to keep your balance, to help you pick your legs up when you run. Um, and, and they tend to be really quite badly affected by the disease, but lots of other muscles too. Um, because they don't work, you also tend to get really tired really easily, fatigued really easily. So uh, if you went on a bit of a run, then it might take you a, a day or more to recover from it, whereas most people would have recovered after a few minutes or hours. Um, the heart, of course, is a really big muscle, and it needs lots and lots of mitochondria. And so if the mitochondria aren't working, your heart can't pump as well. And so that causes cardiac failure, heart failure. Um, we're not quite sure really exactly why, but the, the neutrophils, which are special white blood cells that kill bacteria, they're often affected too. Um, and um, so it's very easy to get um, an innocent bacteria off your skin or perhaps in your nose or your mouth or your gut somewhere. Uh, that will get through um, a small crack uh, where you've bitten yourself or an ulcer or some nappy rash around your bottom and actually get into your blood and spread and cause septicemia, um, sort of blood poisoning. And uh, so if you've got really low neutrophils, um, then when they are very low, your life is, is really kind of walking on a tightrope and it's really easy to get a devastating infection really quickly. So. Um, that's something that we can help by giving preventative antibiotics, just a low dose antibiotic a couple of times a day. Uh, or we can give a, a special bone marrow hormone called GCSF uh, as a little injection under the skin. We often do that two or three times a week and it will um, put the neutrophil count up each time you have a dose and kind of burn out any bacteria that are developing in you and, and so stop things like mouth ulcers, chest infections, skin infections. Uh, and just make your life a great deal safer. And I think one of the real worries about this disease is that if your heart isn't working well and you've got a sort of failing pump, if you like to think of it like that, and then you go and get an infection, which means you have to pump a lot more blood around your body because you get a temperature and all your vessels dilate, and so you have to pump loads more blood. And that makes the pump fail. And so it's really dangerous to have that combination of bacterial infection and a failing heart. Uh, and we suspect that many boys will have died in hospitals all around the world uh, without the disease ever being recognised because they got bacterial infection. Okay. So, we're here today, aren't we, Joe? Because all the families of Bath Syndrome are meeting up today and having a play day, aren't they? What have you been doing in the last couple of days? Have you been at the clinic? Yeah. At the hospital? What sort of things did you do at the hospital? I need to you did Wallace and Gromit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you see Dr. Colin? Yeah. Yeah, and everybody else. And you saw all the other children. Great. Hi, I'm Beth Tsai Goodman. I'm one of the paediatric uh, cardiology consultants in Bristol. Uh, I've been here for the last um, 10 years almost. Uh, and equally been helping at the Bath Clinic for the last 10 years. Um, my particular remit in this clinic, being a cardiologist, is to look after the uh, boys' heart and that involves um, doing echoes, which is an ultrasound heart scan, um, looking at the heart function and um, whether the heart has got worse or better. Um, I also do ECGs, or my technicians do the ECGs, which looks at electricity of the heart and there are other finer tests we do just to look at potential uh, susceptibility to rhythm problems, uh, i.e. heart related issues. And, and that's obviously a big thing for patients or boys with Barr syndrome. There's a risk of um, heart function deteriorating over time. Normally they present with a poorly functioning heart at the beginning when they're little babies and then that generally speaking recover if they are unfortunate that they will have to go ahead with a heart transplantation then that will be performed um, often in the child in early childhood and I am the pediatric dietitian for Bath syndrome service here in Bristol 
I am, well the clinic is set up so we see each of the boys depending on their age for a set number of times, so each a half an hour, see them to an hour. We first of all measure the boys so we uh, get their weight and height and then uh, for those who are over eight years we look at their body composition using something called a Tanita measuring scale and um, we then plot that information on a growth chart. This is the kind of plotting we do. So you can see their heights and weights. And my job is to make sure that they are able to achieve enough nutrition, but not too much nutrition, to keep their growth in line with where they should be at different stages of their, of their life. It, th there is a spectrum. And then right at the other end of the spectrum, you do have some boys who just won't eat at all. So they just cannot get enough food in on a regular basis to meet their growth and they need extra help so they might have tube feeding and that will be in the early stage with a tube that goes up into your nose called a nasogastric tube but an ideal tube would be one that goes into your tummy and that's called a gastrostomy tube and then what we can do is when you're not eating very well or if you're ill quite a lot then give additional milk using the tube without having to physically eat yourself and make sure that you continue to grow. What we see with a lot of people who have lifelong conditions in the early days is a, a big focus on weight gain. And I think it causes uh, a lot of heartache for parents of children with Bar syndrome who struggle really hard to get their child's weight up to a particular centile um, and when you look at the child in fact they're actually um, at a perfect weight for their height or in fact they're overweight for their height. So the big message I would say in terms of nutrition for Bar syndrome is to be able to accept that the growth of people with Bar syndrome is much longer, much slower and the important thing is to allow that child to regulate their appetite and eat to where their weight naturally should be rather than artificially making their weight much higher and causing lots of anxiety for parents. So I'm Vanessa Garrett and I'm the psychologist who's part of the Bar Syndrome Service. Because a lot of our children, we have children who are, we have babies and we look after people right up through to 18 and beyond. So from my point of view, there's a lot of life that happens um, during that period and life can be rocky at times um, and can be slightly rockier when you've got other things to think about, um, like a health condition. So I'm here to really help and support everybody, both children and the families, with, with living with Bar Syndrome and, and life in general. So that might be things like um, taking medications and doing injections, which can be really stressful and frightening when you're really run young and really hard for parents to do sometimes um, if young people are really stressed out by it. Uh, and also to help young people understand what Bar Syndrome is and how to cope with it and what it feels like with a teenager if you don't feel the same as other people or you can't quite do the same things as your peers do. So there's a bit about, um, you know, actually if you're a young person with this, how do you get on and cope with your life and if you want to go for a gap year or there are other things you want to do, how do you make sure that you're healthy and well and you know how to get your meds but actually life is still out there um, and bar syndrome is a little bit of you but it's not you, you know, actually life is out there for the taking. So. My role is to really make sure that um, if there are any things along the way that are stressful or are really difficult, um, then there's somebody here who you can talk to. Today we're here, we're playing, aren't we? And you've just helped me. What have you been helping me do? setting up the lunch for everybody. So everybody's here and they're having a play at the, at the museum. Some of them have been to the planetarium, haven't they? But you can decide you want to go to the planetarium, did you? No, that's not your thing. So you help me up set, set up the lunch. And then later on, we're all going to meet in that room over there and we're going to have lunch together. 
Yeah, so this is, we've been going for about 10 years now with the charity. We started it up, well I started up when my son Nick, who's not here today, but my son Nick was diagnosed with Bath Syndrome. And at the time I'd actually heard of two guys who had Bath Syndrome in the UK. One by the name of Ollie, one by the name of Will. <laughs> and those were the only two that I knew. And uh, so I managed to get in touch with their mums and we set up the Bath Syndrome Trust eventually. And now we have clinic days and we have family gathering days and we fund research and we're looking into treatments and into a cure. And that's what we do, don't we? <laughs> do you want to go play? Yeah. Oh, right. I think that's so we've heard from all the specialists and their roles within the clinic, but here's a behind the scenes exclusive of how Dr. Colin Stewart himself got part of the clinic and how he got involved with the condition. Um, what would be good to talk about first? So, I first got interested in Bath Syndrome uh, back in the 1990s. Um, often in medicine, you might see something once and be interested in it for a little while, read up about it for a little while, and, and then that patient goes away and other patients come with other difficult issues and, and you forget about it. But sometimes you get a little flurry of things so that the same condition comes along or patients with similar problems come along. And it starts to really worry you that it might be something which is more common than it's supposed to be, um, something you might have been missing before. Um, and you start to get interested and, and read more and, and learn more. And I think really that happened for me um, back in the middle 90s when I was running uh, an immune deficiency clinic with some colleagues. And so it started to look as though perhaps there was a series of boys. Um, and so we started to, we got, I got a gene sequencer and the gene just happened to be described right at that time, the TAS gene that causes Bath syndrome. And so we set the sequencer up to actually look at that gene. And again, perhaps it would have all faded out, but another little boy came seriously ill into our intensive care unit. Um, and he had a low neutrophil count when he came in, um, and he had terrible, terrible cardiomyopathy, and, and he turned out to have Bath syndrome. Um, and so that, I think we've just diagnosed our 32nd unrelated family uh, here in the UK. And um, since I think there's only about 200 boys ever been diagnosed in the world with it, um, at least that the Bath Syndrome Foundation is aware of, uh, that suggests to me that there must be huge numbers of boys out there in the world who've got it. And not just boys, of course, it might be older men too. Um, or it might even be babies who died in the womb because you can be easily stillborn with this disease. Uh, and um, I think that many, many of those are being missed. Uh, and if you don't make an accurate diagnosis, you can't really treat people uh, in the most appropriate way. So if you see a boy with a heart failure and you don't know he's got Bath syndrome, you're not going to look at his blood count, you're not going to realise that he's got a low neutrophil count, and that he's got a serious risk of, of getting bacterial infections. Um, and that's something we can do something about. So it really is important to, to make this diagnosis. Um, and equally, it's important then to offer carrier testing within, to, the, to the women in the family and find out who actually carries the gene uh, so that people can have accurate genetic counselling and um, be advised about the risks in pregnancy and this sort of thing. Uh, hello, um, I have a six-year-old son with Bar Syndrome. He was diagnosed at uh, six weeks of age. Um, we live in central London, um, so we are very fortunate that we have access to um, some very good hospitals. We are currently under the Brompton, Great Ormond Street, um, Chelsea Westminster, we have open access. Obviously, we come once a year here to Bristol to the, the main Bath Syndrome clinic. Um, as, as a parent, I think obviously having a child that has been diagnosed with such a serious um, illness and a very unknown illness, um, 
has been very difficult. Um, I think the initial uh, diagnosis, it was the fear of the unknown. You, you, you don't know what to expect, you don't know if there's anybody else that's been affected. Uh, obviously you want to know long term how things will pan out. and. Yeah, there isn't any clear answers and I think every child has been affected differently and I think um, because there are such few children that have been diagnosed, um, I, I think it would be fair to say I'm sure there are more out there that we just don't know about. We're working with the little information we have at the moment and it has been amazing. We have met uh, quite a few families coming here to the clinic in Bristol has been amazing. We have met a lot of other boys, um, younger boys through to older boys and, and we're able to share information and um, speak to some of the families of the affected children and just share ideas and um, experiences um, speak to the professionals here that obviously know a lot about it. I think um, it, it, it would be something we couldn't do without and we try and come every year as long as Alejandro as well and um, I'm very grateful for that. Um, <laughs> now we have been very fortunate that um, um, at the moment our child is doing very well, but when he was first diagnosed he was very poorly. Um, we did live at the Brompton for about four months and obviously he was in severe heart failure. As a family, you know, our world was uh, literally tipped upside down from a normal visit to a, doc to a doctor to being uh, to be rushed into a waiting room in the hospital being told that your child, they didn't know what he had and that he probably wasn't going to make it. But I'm now here to tell you, in my own environment, um, about day-to-day -day stuff that you have to do with bar syndrome. In regards to medical stuff, it's, yeah, small eatings, um, Tamar injections, um, and, so Tamar injections every other day. Chisha said, as you've already heard, um, that's the bone marrow stimulant. And my tablets, which is every day, obviously, um, because I've had a heart transplant, as a few of the boys have as well. So yeah, your anti rejection stuff, you have your steroids, um, you also have your statins, which is like your cholesterol stuff, um, GCSF, and anything else you might need along the way, basically. Vitamins are also very important. Um, what a lot of the boys have to go through is stuff like blood tests. I have to have one every week because of my injections, monitoring, um, stuff like glandular fever, all that. So little things that everyone gets, but you've got to be a lot more aware about it. Um, as well as my tablets, vitamins, all that. Um, blood tests, physio, as we've already mentioned, the muscle. The muscles in the body are very weak. Um, so you've got to be very careful about that. So I do physio every other day for my knees. They get very sore and tired when walking very short distances. Um, that's one of the things that you don't actually hear quite a lot about. Um, muscle weakness is a main part of the condition, huge part of the condition, um, and it hasn't actually been explained that much other than how it affects the tiredness and the pain. Um, examples is this, like, as Colin mentioned, we have, you know, short distances, struggle with running, breathlessness, that sort of thing. Um, but realistically, majority of the lads can only run, well not even run, walk, 100 metres perhaps, most, for starting to feel some sort of pain or tiredness or our breath. This little thing is that most would take for granted, but it's very important to actually understand that it seems invisible, but it's really not. One of the other stuff that's mentioned is obviously this affects boys. Um, my family have had several losses because of the condition, and my family are the pillars. <laughs> To my life, more or less. They have been through thick and thin. Um, they've lost two sons. I was the third. My message to people out there is don't take it for granted. Don't worry if you can't keep up with your mates. Don't worry that you're ill. It happens. It's just 
part of life, lads. And parents, you know, your kids, when they get older, probably won't talk about it that much. It's what you do when you're a teenager, you just dismiss things. Despite how it can seriously build up on you. So, I have had the best life despite it and I would not change it for anything. You've seen the consultants, you've seen the nurses, you've seen the team. Absolutely fantastic people and I would not be here today without their help and neither would any of the lads. It's not as simple as it all seems. <laughs>